kill Nog. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Bullshit. A request I get pretty often, even to this day, is to break down the lost season of Deep Space Nine. That is to say, analyze what they did in the DS9 documentary, what we left behind. Jesus, can you guys believe it's been three years since they did that? Long days, short years. Anyway, when it comes to that pitch, I remember my initial disappointment because it had been billed as a season eight of the series, when really what they did in the documentary was just season eight, episode one. And yes, dear lads, you can actually give an overview for a season and not do just one episode, especially given how much that documentary made. For this review, I'm going to be analyzing the episode presented and whether I think it works or not and how I would have changed it, what creative suggestions I would have given as a fellow writer. Let's just get into it. So the idea is there's going to be an eighth season. This is our Deep Space Nine. There's no one looking over our shoulders. Just a brief reminder, had there been no oversight of Ira when DS9 was still being written, the writer would have had all of Deep Space Nine and Star Trek in general be a part of the mind of Benny Hill. All of it in universe. A again, let me, let me say that to make it clear. None of it would have been real in the Star Trek universe. The ending would have basically said that the original series, The Next Generation, and DS9 were just written by a man. You know, basically the waking up and it was all a dream trope. Because everybody loves that. And if you can believe it, Berman saved us on that one. It's where we think the series in the current landscape of television would go. We're trying to come up with something we could actually produce, yes. theoretically, oh, yes. right oh, now. Okay. Oh, so okay. 20 years have gone by in the story. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to begin on The Defiant with Nog who's in Starfleet. Captain Nog, who by now, Who could be a probably. captain. And they are getting their asses kicked. We start on action. It's evasive maneuvers. It's don't fire back. He's trying to escape. And we don't realize. We're wondering, why was he attacked? What has he got? He was attacked right. by a cloaked ship. By a cloaked ship. For the most part, I'm really with what's happening here. There will be a few major changes that I'll explain in a moment, but I really like the buildup. Why is the Defiant under fire? Why aren't they firing back? Sure, it's a cloaked ship, but there are ways around that. What is so important that they are running and sustaining major damage? There are things happening here that are really articulated well with enough vagueness that you want to continue to watch. While it's never said in the writer's room and probably was a bit of a liberty taken on the back end, I would also emphasize the need to have the cloaked ship's silhouette observed when it fires. So we see the Defiant as just getting pasted from the view of the aggressor ship itself, but we never see specifically what that ship is, just the shimmering when it fires. A nice little hint. I would also add a scene where Nog reaches out to engineering and yells, did it work? We would cut to O'Brien in engineering responding, I think so, but no way to be sure. And then the Irishman would ultimately mumble, damn, they make them a lot faster than they used to. The last piece of dialogue is contrived, I'll grant, but it would be good fodder for those who make a living doing what I do. So there it is. We then cut back to Nog and continue. He's on the run, someone's shooting at him. Maybe he's running for the wormhole. And when he makes it through the wormhole, that's his escape. But on the other side of the wormhole, the ship is out of power and drifting. He looks out the window and he's like, oh, thank God, pan up from the ship. Dun, 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 dun. Well, that's the end of the tease, isn't it? I'll tune in. I want to know what the hell is going on. Yep, pretty solid. Again, this is an episode, not a series, but this is what I'd go with. I really like this. It shows what it needs to show. I think the biggest question posed by the series finale is what happens with Cisco. He's going back to learn from them, he says, in the wormhole, uh, the celestial temple. If he didn't come back, whether time is weird or not, the Reaper, I mean, it, that's big. Remember his pregnant wife and son. Yeah. While the documentary is fun and informative, they do like to retcon and rewrite history, and this is one of those examples. It's worth noting that the only reason we had the line about Cisco returning in the episode 
is because Avery Brooks insisted it be there. Apparently, only Avery was concerned about a black father leaving his pregnant wife and son to fend for themselves. He wasn't ever meant to return. The white writers didn't see a problem with that. In the 90s, at least. But okay, let's play up the fact that he's returning. But time is weird in the wormhole. For him, it's been a minute and a million years simultaneously. Right, yeah. But the he promise made he a made. promise he'd be back. Should the sequence start two weeks earlier on Deep Space Nine so you get a glimpse of what Deep Space Nine is? Deep Space Nine is now a religious shrine. People come to watch the wormhole open. It's Mecca. It's like the, it's a pilgrimage site. Overall, I do really dig this. Given everything that has happened, DS9 being on the front lines and a key part to the Dominion War, Cisco being Space Jesus and returning to the wormhole aliens, and the wormhole itself being right next to the station, because of all this, we're effectively showing what is now a religious temple in space that guards the entrance to heaven itself. It's very Bajoran. Honestly, it's beginning to look a bit like Stargate from a universe aspect in some ways, but overall, it's within theme. I would lean into this hard, truth be told. It would be considered an honor to work on the station as a Bajoran, and there would be a ceremonial attire you could wear, kind of like what Worf wore on TNG. I have a big pitch for Kira. She's a, she's a priestess of some kind. So That's that she, cool. So that she's really, she's Vedic. taking the, yeah. Vedic exactly, Kira, exactly. wow. I think that's really cool. Cool, wow. She's okay. on Deep Space Nine, but as a Vedic. If there was a religious revival on Bajor, it's kind of interesting to get her swept up in it. She was the warrior to save Bajor, and now she's still a warrior, but she's a warrior for the religion. I don't like this. I'm not saying that it isn't an arc that couldn't make sense. Kira was always deeply religious, but she never believed she could be a religious figure. She always shied away from it. Now that said, it is plausible to write a character arc that got her there, and it could be very reasonable, but I just prefer her character to stay a deeply religious worshipper. It was refreshing to see a normal person that believes versus her becoming some sort of space rabbi. I don't know I would have fought hard to stop it, but personally, I think she has a bigger impact if she's just a part of the militia, or the military now. I do like that she's still in charge, and after 20 years, still keeping watch over the wormhole and watch over Cisco effectively. That all makes sense. Quark comes in to see her. She's got the pad where she says, is this true? I, look, I'm just the messenger. I'm delivering the message. You got it. You don't have to come. Well, of course I'm coming. I mean, I don't know who else is going to come. So let's start with O'Brien. Where is he in his life? What is He's he doing? He's the dean of mechanical engineering at Starfleet Academy or whatever, Still? right? Yeah. So we see O'Brien comes home and there's some kind of a invitation. Come to DS9, Keiko's going. We could see Molly. Right, there's Molly's six. 26. Well, touch on the fact that Molly's at Deep Space Nine, which is a big thing. Esri's the commander of a ship and Bashir is her medical officer and they're off boldly going. Now Bashir and Esri are married in there, right? Correct. It'd be nice if somebody was in a happy relationship. Yes, <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind seeing a relationship that's lasted. Okay, so in my version, we don't actually see O'Brien and Keiko. I would have some dialogue where Quark walks in talking about how it's a shame O'Brien won't be able to make it because he's with Nog in the Gamma Quadrant, and then continuing the talk with Kira. We would skip the rest about the Starfleet Academy for now. A minor change here, but not too much. We still have these two in a happy relationship because they deserve to be together, but we have Esri who was at a symposium on Earth. She's returning to the ship she's in command of. While she was at the symposium, the vessel was seemingly on a research mission near the Bajoran sector, looking at, I don't know, seaweed or something. Bashir welcomes her back, and they are happy to be together when they both receive a message. Warp is coming from Kronos. Konos. Kron Kron Q, yeah, Q apostrophe O N O S, I think. It's Martok is old, and he's transitioning out. I think he's got a very close relationship with Worf, and Worf is gonna be his successor. There are rumblings, Worf. Something is going on with Bajor. This is a perfect excuse to show up with a Klingon warship and see what's going on. I think we end with Jake. 
he's Jake Sisko, the novelist now, right? I think Jake wrote Deep Space Nine over the last 20 years. Yeah, he's Benny Russell. Let it go, man. You can't have it. You can't destroy Star Trek, okay? You're a brilliant writer. You added so much to the mythos of Trek, but just let it go. You can't do what many YouTube channels make a living saying Kurtzman does, okay? Okay. I mean, he's off isolated. He sends out his, his stories, his novels, and he's successful at it, just like in The Visitor. If we, if we could see the equivalent of message from Cork, and he just goes, delete. He just deletes it. Yeah, I love that. We should cut to him in the shower. We could just do that whoosh, and see him standing in white for just a second. He looks, there's a reaction shot. In so we're going to see later that this is a vision from his dad. So his dad waits for him to get all nude, soaking wet, and then pulls him into a vision. Dude, DS9 season eight is lit. Big reunion, right? And everyone's in quarks. Quark still is glad to see us, but he's glad to see anyone. Because no one paid their bar bills when they left. Yeah, he still <laughs> got the tabs. He still has the tabs. <laughs> With interest. I generally like how we're framing the reunion, though I would have Keiko show up instead of O'Brien, due to being told that she's going to meet O'Brien here. Everyone comes together after so long and they reminisce, seeing how the changes to their lives have occurred. And this would have been great and cathartic. Unlike what is about to be said, I wouldn't have Cisco be like the complete centerpiece. He would definitely be mentioned, but this is old friends coming together. And it's not just them, we're coming together with them. The audience is watching them coalesce. It's, it would be an excellent scene in the episode. They'd be more than happy just to talk about where they've gone and what they've done. We'd learn that O'Brien was head of the engineering curriculum at Starfleet Academy, but again had to leave for an urgent mission. Keiko would say she didn't know much more, but it was very important. This information would catch Bashir off guard, who would look surprised, then pensive as he was trying to work something out in his head, and ultimately he would look worried. This would be played off, of course, when Esri asks what's going on. You just had that moment of reunion. You, if you put the gang back together in a room, there is that sense of there's the one key element that's missing, that Cisco's not here, and they keep talking about it, and it's the ghost in the room. A man who became a god, and he's supposed to be right over there, the celestial temple, you can see it out the window every once in a while, and there's frustrations, and there's sort of... He never came back. I thought he would come back. Yeah. He said he would come back, you know? Then Jake shows up. Jake's the last one to come. Now that we're all here, we should all go see him. Quark says, yeah, he really wants to see everyone. He's dying. Yeah, it's just he's dying. It's who's dying. So one by one, you sort of eliminate all the suspects. And at this point, you're thinking it's Cisco. Right. And you just cut. And they're walking into the Fontaines. Not a ton to add here. I really talked all about it in the last piece. Overall, I like the build up, and everything is pretty concise. And I love them bringing Vic in. I think that's pretty fun. I just think we should have to embrace the preposterousness yeah. of, the, of yeah. the fact that all these characters are going to come from all over the world to visit a dying hologram. <laughs> I love that, that but that's that. also, I, I, and I think you own that. it because I think there's something heartfelt about that character and in his connection to those characters. Yeah. When you watch the finale, there's so much about that special place and how important it all right. was to them. I kind of buy it. The fun thing is that you walk in there and he's like, don't hit me, Pally. I got news for you. Reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I hate this kind of fan service. It's whatever. I'm not going to fight against it, but it's just, ugh, fuck. And they all look to Quark, and he goes, I don't know. My nephew, Nog, the Starfleet officer, asked me to do this. And then we cut to Nog is on the view screen, and, and now we're caught up in time. I'm sorry I brought you all here on false pretenses, but you'll understand why. And then boom. I like the idea of saying, okay, here he is, beloved character. Look at Nog, he's made it. We love him. Good on you, Nog. Boom. <laughs> Guess what? This is Deep Space Nine. Don't get too comfortable. Oh, please, Ira. At this point, Aaron Eisenberg was still alive, and while Nog was a beloved character, he wasn't a part of the main cast. If you're going to say, don't get comfortable, then grow a pair. 
As I stated, I would have Miles on the ship as well as Nog. Ultimately, Nog would be the one to appear on screen and Keiko would ask if O'Brien is okay. Nog would say that he is. Then, as the captain was about to explain why they had done this trickery, why they were out here, why they had sent out a false invitation so it wouldn't be checked by the Federation and Majoran authorities, the Defiant would explode. This would kill Nog and O'Brien. Everyone is shocked and I would specifically focus on Bashir. But, I would have Bashir turn around just a moment before the ship exploded. It would then focus on him with his eyes closed and his head looking down. Again, just a split second before the explosion. Then, after the explosion occurs, you would see his face was just pained. This is our opportunity to kind of set the table of what the right. situation at the station is. Who's putting pressure on Kira? This her her major. Major whatever his name is. Major Palak. Palak, sure. Yeah, if Palak's the guy who's saying, who is censored, tells us this, and the debris field says that. His ship was damaged coming out of the wormhole. He maybe had some asteroid uh, uh, debris uh, uh, that he hit. I think he's saying it's an accident, nothing to see here. I like the setup of the seeming bad guy and that this person is from the Bajoran military. It has a lot of aspects of what we've seen in previous DS9 and is good foil for Kira. Cut from that two quarks. They're in there and they're drinking. It's like, I can't believe he's gone. And then one person just has to raise the, you know what, the thing that still bugs me. And then it's like, boom, boom, boom. They all start saying, yeah, you know what, this is weird. They're trying to piece together. What was Nog doing? What was he doing? He'd been pushing his engines. The engines tore themselves apart. He wanted to make a big entrance or something. We don't know. And someone has to be saying, no, hey. Molly. I knew Captain Nog. You know, I, I don't, don't even know what, you're what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. This is a guy I've served with. This is a guy who I respected. This is a man. This is like, you guys are talking about a kid you knew back 20 years ago. He drew us here for a reason and he had something to tell us and then he happened to die. Yeah, right. It's, that, it's just too perfect. Yeah. What could be interesting is if Worf, who's now a diplomat, more than he's a soldier, says the treaty of so-and-so. It's very specific when it comes to the death of Federation citizens. Esri, you are in charge of investigating this. I mean, what more can I say than I do love it when the entire cast is together and they're sharing a moment. And it's funny, we're basically looking at a non-Starfleet show with Starfleet elements for the most part. We're having an outside-the-box story, like Picard, but better. Er. There would be obviously no O'Brien present, and it would be in memoriam to both of them. Then the questions would start to come up. Even Bashir, everyone would be wondering how this happened, why it happened. Most would blame it on Nog, and then Molly could stand up and say, no, that is the captain I knew. He is not this kid that you guys think he is. However, once Worf brings up the treaty, the good doctor starts to be resistant to any investigation, saying it's an internal Bajoran issue, and they don't want to stir the pot and lose access to the wormhole. Someone would bring up finding O'Brien's killer, probably Keiko, which would hit Bashir pretty hard, who ultimately acquiesces, but he'd be very reticent to begin. If it's Kira, Palak, and Esri, yeah. and Esri asserting her rights. And I think Esri can say something like, look, the treaty of whatever, Federation gets to yeah, investigate. We have, yeah. we have jurisdiction. I think she should put a clock on it. How long were you planning on staying? Three days, and then you'll catch your trip home. And then Esri walks out, and, and then Palak. it's Palak, Kira, and it's like, well, this is gonna be a problem. Why don't we say beat four is a walk and talk on the upper level of the promenade? Kira is talking to the Federation science officer. And it's like, listen, I want you to look at this stuff. You're the best science officer we have on this station. I want you to do this as a favor to me. I want to see whatever you get before you give it to Esri. She walks away. He's staring out the window. Jake comes up. Were you ever going to come to say hello to me? He goes, hey, I've been here. You're the one who arrived. Turns out he is Joseph Sisko. Joseph Yates Sisko. The reveal that this is Sisko's other son. I think Jake reveals that he's seen his father. I came here because I had a vision. He came to me. He told me to come home. At first, I was a bit iffy on a traitor to Starfleet. Make no mistake, Kira is asking this guy to commit treason to one degree or another. But it being Sisko's son, who has been on the station all his life, and then meeting with Jake, I can dig it. It's definitely plausible. Part 18. Solidly done. The more I analyze this, the more I'm kind of coming around to the plot itself. 
This is overall a good way to write and is keeping suspense and people at each other's throats. Kuro appears to become a villain, though she doesn't seem to like it. The only thing I would add is, again, Esri being upset that she's being told to leave and Bashir pointing out that he said this would happen and maybe they should go home. Esri would get upset that he would even suggest that and we see that there's a rift starting between the two. This is on the Klingon ship, right? Worf is executing the, the afternoon's batch of prisoners. Today is a good day to die for you and you and you. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought, you beam Worf down to base your... And then Garrick appears. They're not particularly friendly. They still don't like friends. each other. <laughs> but it's what the hell's going on. Don't trust the Bajorans. Including Kira? Yeah. Especially Kira. Yeah. You know, it's that kind of... But why wouldn't Garrick reach out to Bashir or... He knows Worf is a man of honor who will act on this information. Worf is a Klingon, and this time we need Klingon rules. We need someone who's going to get pissed off. I do like this. Going to Worf, an enemy, if we want to call it that, would be something very Garrick to do. We could even have Garrick point out how Worf and Martok had gone to Galron. How they had both pleaded for him to send a fleet to help the Federation in sacrifice of angels. An enemy and a friend can make the difference, showing that both Garrick and Worf can do something special. And then we could even have Worf ask how Garrick would have known that, and Garrick would respond that he was pruning the shirt of an ensign who was in the room or something stupid that is obviously not what happened. I'd also have Worf bring up Bashir, and Garrick would get very solemn and dark at the mention of the name. You would see the true nature of the character for just a brief moment. He would then respond, I'm afraid Bashir is not someone I would trust at this very moment. He'd almost be bitter about it. Then we'd continue. Garrick says, Martok wanted proof. I've got proof. Here it is. And he pulls out a thing and he shows him, here's Vedic Kira on a missionary excursion. Those are Jemadar. Yes. They've converted. They haven't announced it yet. They haven't announced it yet but you're looking at the new Bajoran army. <laughs> yeah, we, and we think Nog got onto that, and that's yeah. why he was killed. You have no friends here. Trust no one. Trust no one. No one. The only thing I'd add here is dialogue or pictures where it's not just Jim Hadar, it's legions of Jim Hadar, including ships. <laughs> well, I was thinking the one thing that we did that I know I'm proud of, and I think we're all proud of, is that Bajor never got into the Federation. Season one, episode one was, Ben, you're here to get Bajor into the Federation. Mm. And Bajor said, screw you guys, we're taking your captain and we're making him a god. Look, he's technically correct, whether they meant that or not. Though, if you were so proud of it, Ira, why not highlight it on the show? Kinda odd you just let it slip under the radar, not to mention the retcon of how Bajar really, really wanted to be a part of the Federation up till the finale season. But okay, let's say the Dominion War showed the Bajoran people they shouldn't be or could stand on their own. I'm fine with them not being a part of the Federation, just... Ugh. Guys, documentaries are rarely ever neutral. They want to pretend they are, they aren't. Always remember that. I like the idea of using Section 31 I know they used it in the movie, but it's ours. We created it, and I think it's talking about today's political situation. Okay, look, I love Section 31. I'm not gonna fight ever having it on a show. I also agree that DS9 created it, but I will say this, while they did birth the idea of a black ops organization, Ira is about to fundamentally change that organization here, of which I disagree with the changes, so let's jump into it. I think the plan of Section 31 is this is the example to them in their way of thinking why religion had to disappear from Earth. Because religion separates you from other people. So we have to kill the Bajoran religion. Section 31's plan is, is if you destroy the wormhole and the prophets simultaneously shut down the gate, then suddenly we'll be the big players in town again without them knowing it's us. That's very important. <laughs> no fingerprints. <laughs> right. Once that's gone, then they will see the light, according to Section 31, and without religion propping them up, they'll come into the Federation. All right, so this is just dumb. It's TNG's portrayal of atheists dumb. 
This would mean there is no one intelligent enough in all of Section 31. If anything, religion is a great way to control people. There have been tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people who have been told by other persons that a specific type of god told them to go and get killed in the name of their religion. You could use religion, not abolish it. But that aside, there's no reason for Section 31 to care. Bajor, at least written as Ira is writing it right now, not a rewrite I'm going to do, but what Ira is saying right now, isn't that big of a threat. And they are a staunch ally of the Federation, which is as good as being a part of it in some respects. However, if I did want to have the big bad B Section 31, here's the rewrite I would do. I would have the Black Ops organization know about the same intelligence Garrick had. They realize that Bajor now has an entire legion of Jem'Hadar with ships and even possibly other stations to fill those ships. This could create a large debate within Section 31. What if the Gamma Quadrant Jem'Hadar decide to join? What if the Dominion sees this as a threat or a traitorous act and we have another Dominion war? And we could even have writing where there's some kind of treaty, maybe call it the Treaty of Bajor, where if the Dominion starts a war with any Alpha Quadrant power, the other powers come in to help. That's something that Section 31 would not want to happen. Another Dominion war was not a good idea, so what would they do? Well, instead of destroying the religion, they would move to close the wormhole and possibly destroy all of the now Bajoran Jem'Hadar. It would be the only way to ensure Federation safety. Yeah, ultimately this may destroy the Bajoran religion, but that's not something they care about. The other thing I was thinking was if any of our characters actually did end up in Section 31 and maybe running the goddamn thing, it would be Bashir. Contemporary storytelling, it's allowing some of our characters to have really lost their way, you know? Okay, so contemporary storytelling, that's, it's not randomly throwing a character into an arc cause, oh my god, they grow, but we won't show it, because that's seven of nine levels of betrayal. Look, I'm not against Bashir being a part of Section 31, even him running it, but you have to build up to it, as I've been doing in my rewrites. Also, for this to work, throughout the rest of the season, we would need flashbacks and explanations of why this happened. For me, if I was forced to turn Bashir into a Section 31 operative, you're forcing my arm here, Ira, then I would write it that he and O'Brien still looked into the organization after Deep Space Nine ended. Even Esri was wanting to help. But ultimately, Esri became a ship's captain. O'Brien had another child. Neither of them could really dedicate time to it anymore. This would lead to Bashir becoming obsessed and alone. He would be confronted by none other than Sloane, who had faked his death with Sisko's help. Sloane would show the Doctor that Section 31 helps more than they hurt. Several story arcs would show where Section 31 saved the day. Ultimately, Bashir would realize that the Federation was infested by Section 31, and to kill the Black Ops organization, he'd have to kill the way of life that the Federation gives to other people. So if he can't defeat them, he'll steer them the best he can. Look, I know this is somewhat of a betrayal in and of itself. The writing shows that Utopia can't exist without cold-blooded murder, but Ira is making me do this, so get mad at him, not me. Going where we were going has been tensions rising between the Federation and the Bajoran authorities. Palak is specifically worried that some element of the Bajoran government ordered Nog's death and murdered them. All right, so here's where I do another reveal and humanize, since that's the best term for it, Palak. Palak is ultimately not a bad guy necessarily. He doesn't hate Starfleet, he just loves Bajor and his people. I'd lean into the fact that he doesn't know what happened to Nog, but he has an inkling that the Bajoran government destroyed the Defiant. I would even have a reveal that Nog and him had been really good friends, that they had worked together. There'd even be evidence that Nog was wanting to talk to him about something that he was disagreeing with Kira about, that he got into an argument with Kira over. Palak wouldn't appear evil at first, and he may not be overall. He just wants justice like everyone else. And he also doesn't want corruption in the Bajoran government to cost Bajor everything. He wants to keep it a Bajoran matter, but he wants to make sure that Nog is avenged. Palak eventually is putting the pressure on Kira to like, hey, yeah. kick the Federation off the station. Exactly. Kira is boxed in a bit because of the Jim'Hadar, right? Like she's in yes. on that. 
That's why she's more on edge. She's not as open. She's not happy about she's it. She's not happy, but, but it's a secret she has to hold because that's her oath and she can't tell her, her old friends that this is what their government's really thinking about doing. I think we could do this act in five scenes. Right. However we do it, at the end of four, Joseph Sisko could come find Jake and tell him, I got news for you. Starfleet killed your buddy Nog. Section 31 killed Nog because Nog knew something. What, what he was really finding out was that, the, that Section 31 was going to kill the prophet. He had found that out. He was rushing back to say, holy shit. Yeah, that's the mystery within the mystery, yes. Overall, done well. It brings the brothers back together, and now we're trying to get to the climax of the episode. Hopefully everyone's on edge by now, and we're trying to figure out what's happening. Act five, that's when things spiral out of control. Kira's kicking people off the station, and they don't want to go. And now you got some run and jump or some stuff, and then guns are drawn. Heard a prey moving, you got Bajoran ships moving, there's even a Starfleet vessel coming in. This is gonna explode. And then Kira could show up, what the hell are you doing? I have my orders. You can side out, stand on my side of the barrel or the other side. It's your choice, Medic. You could get that moment where which side will Kira stand on. And she pulls out a security guard's gun and she steps in front of her friends. The guns come up. They're all about to shoot at each other. Right. So again, this is interesting and a great way to have the climax of the episode. We have Bajoran soldiers and Federation officers holding weapons at each other, with Kura trying to talk both sides down. Ultimately, she would join her former friends, and the only thing I would add is for Esri to try to communicate and request help from her ship, and they decline. The officer on the bridge would state that they're following priority directives at the moment. This would cause even more confusion and a standoff where no one knows whose side anyone is on. And then, and a big white light, uh, what's happening? and then Cisco appears. Cisco appears on the Klingon bridge, he appears on the Bajoran bridge, he appears in all these places simultaneously, and then the last place he ends up is with Jake. He turns, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the Deuce Ex Cisco, but if we did it, I would have all of the things you see here happen, but I would add one post credits scene. After the credits, Cisco would appear to Julian, who's in a black uniform and in some kind of conspicuous office. Space Jesus Cisco would lean against the doorframe and simply ask, Did you really think we wouldn't know, Julian? The doctor would look up and be speechless, if not a little worried now that he's been caught. Cut to black for the next episode. Yeah, as I said, I was disappointed they didn't parse out an entire season, especially given how much money the DS9 documentary made. But it's the inner workings of something that could be good. If I was writing the season, Cisco wouldn't be in it for long. He would only be there a while, and he wouldn't be the focus. Because he was with the Prophets for 20 years, he would have fundamentally changed and been something hard to relate to. The story would have ultimately been about Section 31, Bajor in a militarized Starfleet. After the Dominion War, the Federation was scared and wanted to be more Terran Empire than Federation. This season would be about them slowly giving up the reins and returning to a more original series Starfleet, part military, mostly explorers. I'm not a huge fan of the religious Jim Hadar, nor am I a fan of the anti-theist rhetoric in the show. I think you could have a more nuanced discussion with possible aspects of secularism coming up. You could have both the pros and cons of religion and secularism, and Section 31 taking one side and the Bajorans taking the other. But again, I just don't know. The plot is better than I remember, but still not the best. These are just my thoughts, though. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below.